I will talk about four things uh, that I and my generation and my friends and colleagues have done for the love of doing and we have given it a decent burial. Uh, some of it, uh, some of them we are burying and some of it has already been buried. The obituary is yet to be written. Uh, the first one is news journalism that's dead. When we joined journalism, we joined with a sense of naive idealism. There wasn't any money in it. There were other jobs which gave us money, but people came from all kinds of different disciplines uh, and you know, wanted to be a journalist because we, we naively believed that we could change a little bit of what was happening around us. Um, we failed utterly. And so that's uh, one part that I'm going to talk about. In my news journalism years, I uh, accidentally actually started covering conflict. So it wasn't something that uh, moved me when I started. I was pretty much uh, doing Delhi beat, uh, which was boring. Um, and uh, it was just accidentally that I started going to places. I started with Jammu and Kashmir, Leh and Ladakh. Now that is the name of the state which we never uttered. And now of course that state doesn't exist. It's bifurcated. Uh, but it was always, it was never Kashmir, it was Jammu and Kashmir, Leh and Ladakh. Second is that the area which we call the northeast of India. Again, there is no state called northeast of India. There are seven plus one, eight different states, not homogeneous, either in race, culture, history, tradition, cuisine, language. Uh, but I was sent out there, I mean, I chose to go there to cover eight states. And then the other part was what we call the Maoist corridor. Again, a very uh, incorrect way of um, you know, thinking about a place. There is no corridor where Maoist flags are flying. So, and it's a long, it's a huge area of East and Central India, a vast swaths of it. Now, what we would do initially is that we used to paratroop and report these places, which wasn't really good. People out there, they hated us because we would go only when there would be an ambush, only when people would die. And uh, I, I, I felt it wasn't the right approach and I decided to go and live in those places. And uh, I left Delhi and uh, for several years I have lived in those places and reported from those places. So a little bit I'll talk about uh, of what exposed me to, to those places. I wouldn't have spent my own money to go to many of these places. I'll stick to Northeast where I spent more years than other places really at a stretch. I did not, I, I grew up, now I must mention this because context is God, you said. So the content is king, context is God. I grew up, uh, I was born in 69. Um, why I mentioned the year 69? That was a year of Woodstock. That was a year when man landed in the moon. Uh, but when I was growing up, it was a time of great upheaval. It was a time of just after the civil rights movement. Um, you had revolutions happening around the world. You had the Vietnam War around that time. So when I was growing up, the conversation at home, there was a 71, there was the Bangladesh War. Uh, before that, in 1967, many of you out here would not be familiar with was the only time when the Indian Air Force uh, carpet bombed us, one of India's own capital cities and destroyed it completely. In 1967, again, the Naxalbari uh, up, up, you know, uprising happened. A lot of things was happening around between 69, 71, 72, um, which, was be, which became the conversation in the, you know, in, the, in the living room. So it is not something that I was instilled with, but I, you, know, you could hear, I, I, I knew what was happening. Uh, children were playing war games, uh, and one would be India and one would be Pakistan. We would play with sticks. This is how we grew up. Uh, what was happening around the world was that there were authoritarian governments who did not want photographers or documentations or documented documentary photographers to go and report because they didn't want the truth to be out. Uh, something similar that we are facing in 2019. 
and you had people you know go to the edge of misery and basically bring back stories uh, like for example the Vietnam the Vietnam War was so well documented that that is something that came into our drawing rooms that uh, may have influenced me in a way if I look back I don't know how strongly it influenced me but it influenced a lot of us to be able to go and tell the truth and we tried to go and tell the truth were we able to tell the truth I'm not very sure and I will you know come to that of why we fail it's not just the, why new news journalism did not fail news journalism failed for two reasons I think and you can fact check or even challenge me one is that we do not have a revenue model as long as you do not have a revenue model either for a thing that you love to do philanthropy funding is not going to work okay and news journalism will not bring you correct news till till the time we are able to evolve our revenue model about it of how to sustain it without coming under pressure uh, it's only around late 90s something accidentally happened around the world not just in India uh, it started with the Times of India newsroom when the Jain brothers walked in and said that hey you guys are wasting your time and my time writing long uh, articles your articles should be just 700 words because an average Indian spends only 20 minutes reading a newspaper so who are you writing for so my newspaper is going to be filled up with advertisements so around the same time corporatization of media happened okay and while the corporatization of media happened the corporates realized that so far there was a traditional you know engagement between media and the corporates or the government they gave them money we gave them space the corporate said supposing we didn't give them money and we don't want space we've got space on all over the place on you know on hoardings everywhere else we don't need television and newspaper to give us space if we don't give them money we can choke them so what we'll do is that we instead we'll give them a little money and we'll control the agenda they started controlling the agenda and then they also realized that if we can control the agenda we can also control the politics so they started controlling the politics so today you have a situation where actually the corporates control the media and thereby control the politics and the death of news journalism thus has been uh, crafted and drafted uh, while I was doing uh, while I was going to these places however all this did not affect me because no one would go to those places so I was the king there uh, there wasn't a plethora of television channels I, wor I worked for NDTV all my working life okay so uh, and that time NDTV was doing really well now it's in ventilator um, and um, we were we were looked after well we, we were we were plush and um, there wasn't any dearth of money uh, we went wherever I felt like no one ever questioned me and um, I traveled like crazy what what you know what I saw was that two things a, is that more and more places around our country and the neighborhood were falling off the map the more I reported I realized it was so it was still not good enough I mean I had 12 states 18 states to cover it was ridiculous even if I had a chopper I wouldn't have been able to manage that people weren't happy with us um, what we were reporting is that we were actually creating stereotypes so the only picture that you ever saw of a Santhal on a television screen was when there was an ambush or when a Santhali uh, when a Maoist Carter is carrying a gun and moving around the so in Delhi if you had a house to rent out to people and if you had someone like him and uh, some a Santhali girl or a Manipuri boy or a Naga girl who would you give your house to because we we and I I point my finger we created stereotypes which create which in in a, in a sense created discrimination okay I think we were responsible partly for the disc, for the kind of discrimination that we see in the country today and I tried to then go ahead and mitigate it which is again a failure how do you mitigate discrimination and stereotype which of course is, goes far far deep into our thing that caste biases and all of the biases and areas of each time I went to this new part of the country a new village new state I brought back stories I we are storytellers so we tell stories thank God for stories stories connect us stories are the only connecting tissue of the human race but the more stories had to be told there were just too few every story had to be told every story was important but I couldn't bring back 
uh, that many stories. There wasn't enough time, there wasn't enough space because the space was being taken over by advertisements. Space was taken over by television debates. Space was taken over by, by the corporate. You know, we were, reportage just completely shrunk. I mean, when was the last time you ever saw a story come out of Lakshwadeep, tell me? Have you ever thought how water goes to Lakshwadeep? It's an island. Island doesn't produce water. Every day, ship of drinking water goes from Kochi to Lakshwadeep. That's how people survive there. Have you ever thought how electricity is generated in Lakshwadeep? It's an island. It's saline water. You don't generate water out of sea. Yeah, electricity out of sea. Have you ever thought how medical care happens in Lakshwadeep? Every six months, doctors from All India Medical Institute and Savdarjang, they go out there reluctantly. And they want to take the first flight out, which is not a direct flight. You have to come to Kochi, you have to come to Kavarati, then come to Kochi, then come to Delhi. Uh, it's tough. We don't report. We haven't reported. We failed reporting. And then, of course, now there is no scope of reporting. Okay, when was the last time you... Have you ever heard of a place called Dawn in India? Yes. That's the first place where the sun rises. Anywhere in the world. That's in Arunachal. We don't know how people live there. Um, so anyway, we st I started reporting those places as much as I could, making films on them, the long format, the short format, etc., etc., etc. Not good enough, it wasn't really working. So I started writing books. Because I thought in a, bo in a book you can write longer. The other attempt, let me tell you, another obituary. You write for the love of writing. How long do you sustain it? You put in all your money, you put in all your efforts, sweat, blood, reputation into it, one little information that goes wrong, you'll be held for that for the rest of your life. And what do you get? Peanuts. The public publishing industry is in doldrums. It doesn't know how to handle itself. They may as well open a Kirana Dukan. You have bookstores of the size of, you know, your Bari Sons is your best bookshop in Delhi. Really? I mean, you can't, three people can't get into that damn bookshop. Bookshops used to be where you go in, you know, browse through books, sit. There was also a bookshop called Bookworm once upon a time in Connaught Place, a very good bookshop, again, a small little rat hole. And I always felt that, you know, why can't they just in increase their, you know, size a little? Bookshops started shrinking, publishing industry went in doldrums, but, you know, um, we kept writing. And uh, so my first book that I wrote was called Che in Pauna Bazaar, Tales of Exile and Belonging from India's Northeast. And exile and belonging is the, you know, the words which kind of stuck to me and I started working around exile and belonging because I felt that we all, at some way or the other, metaphorically, physically, in reality or in future, will be exiled, are exiled, and we have a sense of belonging to something. Um, we are more privileged, but there are others who are not so privileged and, you know, how do they handle exile and belonging? And I came... I mean, I started asking or, you know, discussing that what are the critical areas that the human history or the human race is going through right now? I think three. The human-machine interface. Artificial intelligence. How do we cope with it? We, we, have to, we have to figure something out. This morning I was sent a picture by, uh, by one of my old colleagues, a camera person, a picture of, a, of him hanging from a chopper, taking a uh, you know, a shot is written 2009, and in 2019 it's a drone. The pilot has lost his job, and the camera person has lost his job. How do we deal with that? If we don't put human in the middle of the design, that design is is, is a scary design of the artificial intelligence. But it's it's there. We have to we have to cope with it. We have to deal with it. The second is the problem of migration, and that's where the exile and uh, belonging comes. Migration is a reality. Migration has happened in history, but that was probably a good migration, probably a natural migration. The migration that we see now, witness now, facing now, we, will, we, are, we are going to be part of it now, is going to be, is, is, is the scary migration. And we, we know about it, I don't need to talk about it. I will show you a few artifacts uh, from migration thing, if I have the time. The third thing is, of course, uh, along with migration, is the water crisis, and the food crisis. Water. How do we how do we look at water? So I, I think before we started, we were, you were talking about that you all branded some um, stuff, designed some stuff around water. Yeah. So I, I do, I do. Water, yeah. So I use water as a way of talking about the company's ethos. 
Uh, so, so I, I, can, I, of course, I, I, I'm not an eco ecologist, so I can't, you know, take questions on water, but uh, the last festival that I did, I'll talk about it, will, was on wa water, is on water, and uh, the series of dialogues that we are doing right now is again on water. So, you know, I, I think, you know, human-machine interface, migration, water, these will be uh, really critical things uh, to work around, either with design, art, uh, livelihood, anything. And, you know, these are the words, the key words that kind of were distilled last, you know, words after years of moving between borders, uh, areas which are off the map. I've got five minutes, thanks. And uh, so I started writing books. I told you the first book was Chain Pound Bazaar. The second book, which is actually um, nothing to do with exile, but something that I researched for years and something is relevant to talk about today because of the great clamor that happened in yesterday across the country. The entire country was bloodthirsty and talking about how jubilant they are about us for uh, people who've been killed. So my, for 20 years, I've actually researched on encounters. And the second book was on encounters. Encounter, till I wrote the book and the manuscript went and the Australian editor who was looking at it asked me, so is it a romantic thriller? And I said, no, it is not a romantic thriller. It's about killing. And I said, why do you ask whether it's a romantic thriller? He says, because in the West, the word encounter means a romantic encounter. And I don't know how the word encounter in Indian lexicon entered at what point of time. It came in when first in Telangana, then in Calcutta, where Siddharth Shankar Rai actually made it into an art of how to kill people. And then uh, Gil in Punjab, and then uh, in Assam, what, in Mahanta, in Secret Killings in Manipur and now of course we find it all over the country. Uh, various forms are taken in Tamil Nadu, in Chennai, uh, Sujata from where you come, they use the public transport bus to actually uh, kill people off. In um, Bombay they use um, uh, Tata Sumos, uh, in the, wherever the army operates it's much easier because you have the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, a Draconian Act which gives you immunity to kill anyone on, based on suspicion so you can just go on killing people. So, Killing people, of course, is like a game out here uh, for the state, and it happens. So yesterday is Hyderabad, four, four guys killing off. It's, it's, it's just one, it's just another killing. And that's something that I researched on, worked on. And the third book that I worked on, uh, I wrote, was an, on the 50 years of Naxal uh, uprising and the hostage crisis where I found myself in with two Italian tourists, and I managed to rescue one of them. So I used that as a... It was a dramatic encounter, it, it just accidental again happens, there's nothing uh, that I can take credit for. Uh, but use that to talk about, again, you know, exile, migration, the whole tribal uprising, the sixth schedule, the fifth schedule, etc., etc. And now I'm working on a book on uh, identity, citizenship, and statelessness. Um, um, trying to start working from tomorrow and finishing the book uh, over the winter break. Uh, and I teach uh, at, uh, in, a in an university at OP Jindal University, and I teach journalism there, sustainable, only sustainable thing that I realize. In between that, uh, uh, because education is not going to go out of business, uh, healthcare is not going to go out of business. So I think these two are going to be there, but though you have to run for ranking, which is a scam. And um, in between, what I did is that when I was, th 2013, I, I, I hung my boots. Sounds good to say, hung your boots. Actually, just quit. I was physically exhausted. But looking back, it feels I can actually say that, oh, I knew what was happening to the news world, so I quit. I didn't. I mean, I, I didn't know what was happening. By 2014, which was my last dispatch, uh, the day uh, the Narendra Modi gave his first uh, election campaign address where he says, Devale nahi sochale. And I said, this man is becoming the prime minister. I thought, and I thought that was a stupid thing to do, and I published it somewhere, and well, now I say, oh, I knew it. Actually, I didn't know. Um, so, I started curating, curating is a bad word I'm told, I think collating, maybe collecting. Um, uh, art exhibition, an annual exhibition at Indian International Center called Art East, and out, that was uh, substantive. It talked about art, livelihood, migration, climate change, past, present, history, etc. And uh, the first year we worked on climate refugees, and I picked on Majuli, uh, which is the largest river island in the world, and Brahmaputra is shrinking every time. It was also 20 years of someone called Sanjay Ghosh who had gone out there to start work and was murdered, abducted and murdered. His wife does not 
use the word murdered because she's, you know, his body was never found. So, uh, and we kind of commemorated, uh, we commemorate one person and then we work around that. Marjorie, the climate refuges, I brought some uh, little stuff if I have the time to show you uh, of a photo studio which actually went underwater and we made a film of this guy called Kanai who was standing on the banks of the river, very stoic and um, supervising the, you know, his house being broken down and we were, we were filming it and I said, aren't you feeling like bad if your house is broken down because the river has come too close? He says, no, this is the fifth time I've done this. Now we're going to go two kilometers inside. So every moment, large chunks of earth are eaten up by the river every second. So what happens is that we worked around the art because the art in Amajuli, which was set up uh, by Shankar Deva, polymath, a 15th century neo Vaishnavite reformer who set up monasteries out there is mask making and pottery. Now you use mask making pottery, art is something that actually with migration dies. Dance, music, song usually goes, the art dies because you use local materials to create that art. Only five mask makers are alive in Majuli. We brought them out here uh, to show us the rest of the people are moving away because of the climate. They are climate refugees. The word still not in currency very much, but it's going to get into currency very soon. Um, on the second uh, edition, we were thinking of how do, how do I think of the Northeast, Southeast. I don't look at Northeast as one. I look at it as a bridge between South Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, I don't think so we can look at South Asia in isolation because Southeast Asia is very important. And if you look civilizationally, that was the same route, okay, for millions of years. Uh, there was a Buddhist civilization that uh, flourished out there, um, following the principle of Dwairajya, where the man and the woman both actually commanded, the, the, you know, governed together. And if you go to the museum in Tripura, you'll find coins indicating that. So the second thing I think, I, I was thinking, I'll take 30 seconds, I'll wrap up. Um, how do I think of that region? Because it doesn't have, like I told you, culturally it's not homogeneous, but yet it seems like one. And I stumbled upon MP Ranjan and uh, bamboo. And I thought bamboo is a way of life. They eat bamboo, they build bridges with bamboo, they build houses with bamboo, their handicrafts is bamboo. Everything is bamboo. Uh, that's a grass. Um, so we worked around bamboo and you know, had uh, an exhibition again paying a little tribute to MP. And that's when Aditi uh, got you and I in touch. Uh, the third one, uh, which happened this year, is, uh, was on the river. And I said, which is the, big, which is the one, and again, one thing that connects between South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Northeast? It is the Brahmaputra, the fourth largest river in the world. Where does it come from? From Mansarovar, as a Sangpo enters into an impenetrable gorge, the deepest point of the earth, if you knew. That is called the belly of the earth. The deepest point of earth is just uh, from Tibet to Arunachal, as you get in, called the Sangpo Gorge, where no one ever could get in, go in, till 1997, a guy called Ian Baker managed to get in there. It's a gorge within a gorge. And you can go in, uh, you just can't be a trekker and, you know, explorer and reach out there. You have to understand Tibetan manuscripts to be able to go there. Um, it's, it's a different story altogether. Ian came for the festival, took us through his entire journey. And then of course, so it's basically it's Sangpo, Siang, Brahmaputra, Jamuna, not the Yamuna, Jamuna, uh, Padda, Meghna. Which river comes and meets Padda? The Ganga. We talk about the Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb all the time. We don't talk about the Ganga Brahmaputra Tehzeeb. I wish we did because then we would have covered a much larger area. Then we would have covered the civilization in a way. While we were discussing that, someone in the audience raised their hand and said that, well, you're discussing about Siang, but my river is Narmada. And we realized that, well, we need to talk about rivers all over the country. And we started this conversation called River Dialogues, um, where we are not talking about how many cusacks of water a river carries, but we are talking about the bhavtal of the river. We're talking about the rhythm of the river. River as a body, river as an entity. Rivers were the ancient highways of the world. You didn't have roads. And now you treat river like a, you know, oh, the river. But it is the river. We want, to, we want to start, you know, creating a kind of an imagination as river imagination. Um, and um, to end, that is the last thing that I have to probably bury this year because I've run out of funds to do the festival. So I'll stop here. Thank you.